Hello and welcome to the Yacht Channel. Today I'll be having a conversation with my friend Chuck Lever, who is the yacht person manager at Tampa Ship, which is this uh, yard here. Uh, you'll have a link to that if you want to see it. Um, that is a big commercial facility in Tampa, Florida, and uh, what is less known about it is that it is uh, currently being used by a lot of the largest yachts uh, for doing major refits. And uh, Chuck has an interesting history that he'll tell us about that crosses over between the commercial world and the yacht world. My attention was drawn to the operation in Tampa and to the Chues Group uh, because of the uh, capabilities of their offshore supply vessels and their adaptability to be converted into world-class expedition yachts. So uh, let's get into the conversation with Chuck Lever. Hello, Chuck. Welcome to the Yacht Channel. And where are you today? I'm based in East Hampton for the summer and uh, gives me uh, easy access to uh, Sag Harbor, especially about uh, 10, 15 minutes away. So Chuck, uh, what I wanted to do is talk today about Tampa Ship and all of the uh, things that are connected and going on around Tampa Ship. I work for Edison West Offshore, but one of my, uh, one of my um, hats that I wear is uh, business development, I guess, sales and marketing for Tampa Ship, which is a shipyard we acquired in Tampa, in the port of Tampa Bay, um, mainly to service our own vessel. The four dry docks that we have at Tampa Ship are, uh, are deep enough and big enough to do uh, uh, just about anything we need uh, as far as uh, new builds, uh, vessel repair. So what we're looking at here, this is just one of the dry docks. Well, actually you're looking at two. So on the right is our dry dock number four, which goes into that building. Um, we currently have a 92 meter vessel under construction in a dry dock inside that building. So it's an incredible facility. You have a lot of yacht experience in your past. I uh, grew up in a boating family and uh, even before I got out of college, I started yachting when I was in college. Right, and, and because of that, um, because of your connections back into the yacht industry, um, this facility, which probably has been pretty much 100% uh, dedicated to commercial activities um, until your involvement, and now... Yeah, well, we're fortunate right now. We have, uh, we have a project that we're just wrapping up in the yard that is not, uh, uh, you know, covered in secrecy. We... Uh, more often than not, when vessels, uh, yachts come into the yard, we're, uh, we're restricted in what we can talk about with NDAs. So it's, the, yeah, in, in some ways, it's the, it's the best kept, uh, you know, big yacht company, best kept secret in the business <laughs> because we can't talk about a lot of, of what we do. And I would say um, as, a, as somebody that uh, sometimes is seeking uh, places to get service done on large yachts, that opportunities, um, for yachts, say, uh, 75, 80 meters or over on the U.S. East Coast are quite limited. There just aren't a lot of options, and you have been a hidden asset uh, until recent years, probably, now is being discovered. So certainly, as far as tonnage, even probably as linear feet, the most active segment of the yacht business has been the 70 to I don't even know what the biggest, biggest boat is now. The ones that get up near the 300-foot range uh, these are not toys. These are ships, and they have to be constructed uh, to a to a class and specification that is identical to the commercial boats. Well, that's an interesting point. We have a uh, a, a partner in Norway, uh, the Olstein family. We have a fleet of vessels that we operate in the North Sea, island offshore, and uh, a lot of those European systems uh, are are the same systems that we see on some of the European built yachts. So. And, and further to that, yachtsmen marvel when they see azipods and diesel electric <laughs> and uh, things that are considered to be new technology in the yachting industry. And these are not new technology for the commercial builders. Yachts have, have started using uh, azipods and even hybrid systems. But, uh, but yeah, these are systems, diesel electric uh, uh, propulsion systems have been in offshore supply vessels for close to 20 years ago. 
So, Chuck, I sold this vessel. It's a 303-foot uh, NOAA ship built by the U.S. government. And it had uh, four diesel generators. It had two large Westinghouse motors. Um, it would cruise at 20 knots. It topped out at 22 knots with an 18,000-mile range. So uh, this is a 50-year-old vessel. Certainly in terms of technology, performance, and capabilities, the government and commercial vessels uh, have been the leaders. And then with the impl implementation of uh, uh, dynamic positioning requirements, uh, the systems have gotten so much more sophisticated. With Marine Technologies, uh, our company that does integrated bridge, monitoring or navigation, communication, monitoring, control, alarm systems, dynamic positioning systems, all proprietary Schwest systems, in, in, including um, the remote monitoring system that we monitor our vessels 24-7. Uh, we have already installed systems on Lursen, yeah. Uh, we uh, uh, installed uh, the Turquoise Yacht Go, I think 77 meter, has a full uh, Schwest Marine Technology Integrated Bridge System, including a DP system. And that sort of brings us to uh, my favorite subject, which is conversions of offshore commercial vessels uh, into exploration yachts. And the yacht industry, the main designers have decided that uh, expedition and exploration yachts are in vogue. What naturally follows is the possibility of, instead of building a boat from scratch, uh, which is always possible, but to take an existing, very capable offshore boat and convert it into an expedition yacht. You and I have had this conversation many times, Paul. <laughs> There's the, uh, the platform for a conversion is an excellent one, especially, in a, in a, I'm going to toot our horn a little bit, the Schwest boats, which uh, we, we went to a more efficient hull design many years ago to offer vessels that were more efficient through the water. So the hulls have more shape to them. Uh, the, the, the latest models have bulb spouts, and, uh, but they're, these vessels are designed to work in any weather for long periods of time, carrying heavy cargo. And uh, when you design a, a yacht that uh, has the capability to go anywhere for long periods of time, uh, and, and as you know, they want to carry more and more cargo, not just liquid cargo like fuel, and, uh, but, uh, but also submarines, multiple tenders, fully commercial helicopter pads, uh, garages to store these, uh, uh, if you will, toys. It requires a lot of deck space, a lot of load capacity, uh, but um, even with additional superstructure and all the toys on board, you do not come anywhere near the load capacity of these hulls. Uh, they're designed, that's what they're designed for. You know, they're designed to carry heavy loads and go long distances and be self-sufficient um, for weeks on end, right? With, uh, with, with, with no corner of the world off limits. We even have, uh, we even have supply boats with uh, ice glass. Full ice class. This is sort of an interesting story, which will lead into Gresham's uh, more sophisticated vision of this. Tell us about this little drawing. Boat International has a um, conference every year, Super Yacht Conference. And uh, one of the things that uh, they challenge the uh, naval architects and yacht design uh, attendees uh, to a design challenge. Uh, they got a description of a gentleman who uh, was, a, a, I think he was a, a younger uh, a gentleman. Uh, he had dogs. He was interested in uh, actually tilt wing rotor aircraft. Uh -huh. Yes, there it is. <laughs> yep. So, so there was a list of things that this fictitious person was interested in and they were challenged to take an existing supply boat and convert it into what they visioned his dream boat was. And uh, so they're all divided up to teams and sat down at tables and said, start drawing, right? And uh, Steve, Steve won the competition. Okay, so this, this is on an existing hull. And, uh, it's a 220-foot uh, supply boat. Uh, it was originally built in uh, 
1998. Yeah, so here, here's, here's a more sophisticated rendering of that uh, little drawing. So he took the concept to the next level here, right? So uh, I sent him even more information about the vessel, and uh, this is his vision of a full conversion. If one were to do this uh, conversion here, um, they could do it in your shipyard. How long would it take you to convert one of these? So I'll give you some ranges. I mean, we most often, you know, we're presented with a lot of these types of questions uh, for taking uh, an existing Schwest supply boat and converting it. And it ranges from people who want uh, somewhat of a kind of a commercial finished interior, more of a utilitarian vessel uh, to possibly support a, a yacht or uh, just the, the requirements for yacht level interior aren't there. Uh, they want a platform for their expeditions, helicopters, toys, submarines, tenders, fish boats, what have you. Um, Basic conversion we can do in 12 months. You know, the, the interiors and the, the, the craftsmen involved in the conversion uh, can be all in-house personnel. We build ships at Tampa Ship. We've built uh, several of our 90 meter vessels there and uh, uh, the interiors on a modern uh, uh, offshore supply boat are pretty impressive. You've seen them. I've taken you on. Yeah, they are. I mean, I, I call them Marriott quality or better. And those 90 meter vessels, you turn those out. How quickly do you, from, from start to finish, do you do a 90 meter at Tampa? We were launching a 90 meter PSV at Tampa ship uh, about every three or four months. And start to finish, we could build one in 12 months. That's impressive. That's building in a series, you know. I mean, that's when sure. you're building, uh, when you're launching one every three or four months and you've got uh, 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 basically, it's almost assembly line production, right? They're all the same. Right. You're yep. building one after another. So there's, there's lots of things that can add six months to the process here, six more months there. And I think a conversion, 12 to 24 months. One of the other advantages that you seem to have when we've done some bidding with you is that you do so many of the tasks in house. You don't have a lot of subs coming in and out of the shipyard. No, very few. Um, we have, uh, we, we design and engineer the boats ourselves. We build them in our own shipyards and uh, the welders, the machinists, the carpenters, the electricians, the integrated bridge systems, the HVAC systems, all, all are in-house. Your company ends up operating these vessels that you build. Correct. We own and operate them. Uh, we have a fleet of about 200, well, it's over 250 vessels around the world that are mostly oil and gas, but uh, we have a fleet of tugs that work for the Navy, that work for uh, Alaska Pipeline, uh, the Alaska Pipeline Terminal in Valdez. We have uh, um, recently, there was an unfortunate incident in San Diego where there was a, a Navy vessel on fire. If you notice those orange tugs spraying water on the fire, those were our tugs. Mm -hmm. And you do, and you train your own crews. I, I pulled up this video which I love, where you uh, have a simulated uh, helicopter turnover in the water. Right. That's, That's uh, the Hewitt training, which uh, everybody flying offshore is required to, to take the Hewitt training. You have to be able to escape. Uh, you're watching it right there. The guys have to be able to get themselves uh, out of the, the uh, helicopter. So I dare say not too many uh, shipbuilders have that capability. And there's... Uh, not only uh, Hewitt training, but there's simulators. Um, we actually have two full simulation rooms where you can have two active simulations going on at the same time. Another interesting point about the, the big yachts and the owners during this COVID-19 uh, epidemic, a lot of them are uh, seeking refuge on their boats, right? And uh, not getting off. Uh, I know of three owners who at the beginning of uh, the uh, pandemic, I guess, uh, uh, took refuge on their boats and stayed there, have not left the boats. Um, the, and not even to visit uh, short, quick shore visits. 
some of them were down in down island one of them was down island that's a boat that was supposed to come to tampa for dry docking and the owner was on board with his family and uh, stayed on board i believe stayed on board for the crossing going back as well and uh, uh a fairly well-known boat up here gene machine uh gentleman is on board and uh he's uh, uh from what i understand he's has a team of his scientists on board and they're working on a, a rapid test for uh, COVID-19. But uh, Rising Sun came through um, and uh, same thing. They were all on board and headed to Maine. I think that's where they are now. And uh, right, well, Boats, Quantum of Solace, uh, Fountainhead, Six Sense, Felix Kisses, Scout, Lioness Five, Sakara, Unbridled, Dreamboat, um, all, all have been through Sag Harbor the last couple of months. So have we missed anything? Most people don't put it all together. You know, they don't realize that uh, that uh, we have in uh, companies that I represent for the family to the yachting industry, uh, Sealand Mechanical, HVAC Systems. We just did a huge project. Uh, uh, we, we mentioned earlier that we couldn't talk about a lot of vessels that uh, come into Tampa ship, but we have a vessel there, um, a 72 meter Benetti, that a lot of people remember as Reverie, now called Freedom. And we did a, they've been in the yard for a couple of months. We did a big project. We, uh, we installed a brand new pair of quantum Dynafoil stabilizers. The first ever pair installed, by the way, and uh, had, to, had to replace a 40 foot section of hull on each side to give the hull the structural stability for all of the new uh, uh, forces that uh, these new stabilizers put on the hull ended up being quite a project. And uh, uh, the captain uh, and the manager of the boat were, were very, very happy. Well, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. And uh, we will get the word out on our podcast and uh, it will have links to reach you back at the shipyard. Uh, and uh, we will uh, look forward to checking in with you in the future as uh, exciting things happen there. Great. Thanks. That concludes today's podcast. You will find links below to the shipyard in Tampa and also links to some of these videos that we used for illustration and a link to a website where you can find more information about converting commercial vessels into expedition yachts. And we look forward to seeing you on the next Yacht Channel podcast. Be sure to subscribe and we will see you soon.